What are we calling this episode? I don't know. Welcome to another D3 Datacast. I'm Zach Snyder, joined by Matt Snyder. Matt, we had a little bit of a lighter week on the D3 Hoops calendar, but we have some games to talk about nonetheless. Let's start here, Matt, as we've made a custom. Is there a team that you would say won the week? Yeah, I had to think about this question for a minute because we've been talking about the the weekly champions. I'm going to pick Virginia Wesleyan, though. I think they had a very nice week. Uh, I think they had three games. They were 3-0. and The signature win this week was against Christopher Newport. Um, Virginia Wesleyan's been sitting in that others receiving votes category in the d3hoops.com top 25. But they look like a legit top 25 team to me, especially after this week. Another good week for them. They were number 17 on my last ballot, so I certainly believe them. I think we're going to see the Marlins um, in the next ballot, which isn't until, I think, after the new year. But I would I would not be surprised if we see Virginia Wesleyan solidly in that top 25. Another ODAC team kind of making that climb into the top 25. Really good league this year, especially at the top. Um, and I think Virginia Wesleyan belongs in that conversation as well. So I think the Marlins won the week for me, Zach. What about you? Who won your week in D3? So maybe it's a bit of a homer week or a homer call, but I'm going to go with Calvin, Matt. This game that they had on Saturday against St. Norbert, I was just seeing as a potential trap game. Uh, I know that at Calvin, they had a finals uh, this past week. So just you know, going through exam week, getting on a bus, heading to Wisconsin against a really good team on the road. I just emotionally, I was prepared for bad things to happen. Of course, bad things did not happen. Calvin won by 22. Uh, and, you know, maybe it's uh, just me still still kind of uh, gaining confidence as a fan. Uh, but, you know, also, I just there's so much great D3 Hoops discourse out there. Maybe um, I should have been uh, more concerned a week ago, you know, we've, with with the great um, interviews we hear on Hoopsville, QCast. I feel like I've heard a couple times that some coaches have said it's not actually the game coming out of exam week that they're most worried about. It's that it's that game heading into exam week. I don't know if it's just, you know, they get done with exams. There's a bunch of relief. They go out and play uh, much freer. But um, regardless, no trap game. Belvin came out. They look yeah. really good against St. Norbert and uh We'll celebrate a win. Yeah, you mentioned exam week there. I think that was true for a lot of schools. Um, I saw some tweets. You know, this guy had an exam that day, and then on Wednesday night he goes out and drops 30. Uh, who, who won the week are all these students who are taking exams and then playing basketball games and per- performing at a higher level. Um, that that That's, you know, it's always difficult this time of year. It's difficult to juggle school and a sport, especially a top-tier sport like a lot of these Division three basketball players are playing. Uh, but then to do it exam week, that's got to be completely difficult. So so props to all of the players out there who who did that juggle. Uh, we salute you. They're real athletes. They're real students. That's a lot, a lot yeah. to handle. Um, yeah, shouts to them. So, but Matt, it was, uh, as we mentioned, a little bit of a lighter week overall, but there were a few games that caught our eye. Let's start uh, going back through the, the week um, in, in some of those games. Wednesday. Uh, New Jersey City took Rowan into overtime. Matt, 200 points were scored in regulation, 100 each. Uh, but it was Rowan who was able to take control in the final minute of overtime and come away with a 114-111 win. What were your thoughts from uh, NJCU and Rowan going to overtime? Yeah, really entertaining game. This was one that I kind of caught wind of. I think I sat down in my chair and checked out some D3 Hoops games. And this was in the last kind of several minutes of regulation and then overtime that I was able to tune in and catch. Really, really good back and forth game. Um, yeah, big for Rowan, I think, to 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 get away with the win there. Uh, Marcellus Ross had 33 points for them. Uh, big individual effort there. Uh, Hakeem Wilson had 27 for New Jersey City. Um, great individual efforts, but great team games, I think, for, for both players. Really entertaining one. I think the NJAC, my sense of the NJAC is it's going to kind of eat itself up a little bit this season. Uh, it's a conference where certainly almost anyone can win on any given night. It's kind of even. I think maybe it, to me that that league is missing the top level teams that they had last year, maybe in, in Rowan and Stockton, who are tournament hosts last year. Maybe they don't quite have that this year, uh, but they still have some depth. It's still a really good league. And any given night when you turn into NJAC, it's going to be an entertaining game. Yeah, we talked about Ramapo being one of those teams that's maybe flying under the the radar in last week's episode. Uh, just, you know, another team to add into the mix in the NJAC that, uh, you know, people haven't taken note of yet, yeah. um, probably should start to do so. Yeah. Um, you know, Matt, we mentioned exams, and it seems like as coaches are putting together schedules, this is not the time that they're choosing to challenge themselves as, as much. So 
you know, those really good, you know, ranked versus ranked team matchups have, were a little bit elusive this past week. But we did have Swarthmore, who remained in the top 25 despite uh, the loss last week. Um, but so it was number 24, Swarthmore hit the road to take on number six, Hampton, Sydney. And Matt, uh, as they've been so often, the Tigers were not uh, very hospitable hosts. I'm sure off the court, you know, they they treated Swarthmore very well, but on the court, they did not treat treat them treat them well. Um, yeah, Hampton City really put the pedal down. I think right from the go, it was it was 21 to seven in the first 10 minutes of the game. Um, it didn't really get even any closer from there. A 15 point lead at halftime, 21 at the final buzzer, 67 46 final margin. Hampton Sydney beats Swarthmore. Um, that's a resounding win. That's another really good performance for Hampton Sydney. Um, I think it's time to talk maybe past time to talk about Swarthmore, some concerns here. Uh, I think they've played four ranked teams this year, if I have them all correct. One was the buzzer beater win. They beat NYU on a banked in three-pointer, a game, quite frankly, NYU let slip through their fingers. Other than that, their other three ranked games, they've lost by 20 or more points. I think that's a Wash U, a really big defeat opening weekend. They lost to Widener, I think this last game, and then now Hampton, Sydney. That's three 20-point losses. I mean, ranked teams, great teams. Uh, but you don't want to lose all of those by 20 plus points. I think it's really time to take a step back from Swarthmore. You know, we saw them in the Final Four last year. They've been highly ranked. I think they've deserved some of that. Um, but now, like, I think there's some question marks on this team, and maybe it's time to take a step back from them from the rankings. I think I had taken um, them out of my poll last week, but I think, yeah, I think, I think they have some some things to figure out there. Yeah, in a year where voters have so many options, yeah, you know, you can't be losing all those games. Uh, by, by 20, 20 points, points or more mm-hmm. for sure yeah yeah it's it you know it's it's not what you want to see in terms of a top 25 conversation to be losing all those games and then add on top of that they really haven't been yeah. as competitive even as you would want them to see and with so many options on the table you can see how probably uh the clocks run out on the garnet for, um, for mm-hmm. maybe for the for the time being yeah for the time being but uh we'll see what that final product turns out to be later in the year Matt, we talked about Virginia Wesleyan a little bit. They won at number 12, Christopher Newport, 74-68 in the Battle of the Mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, To be honest, I wasn't able to tune into this one. But, you know, I took a look at the box score and I was was like, what's the deal? Um, Trey Barber played just 12 minutes. Uh, Ian Anderson also not available for this game. Um, So, you know, the, the Christopher Newport captains, Matt, still... They've had some injuries issues earlier in the year and it seems like that's kind of a continuing theme um as we uh you know reach kind of the tail end here of the non-conference uh season yeah it seems like every game either you tune in and they say someone's not available or you check the box score and and someone didn't play i think they've been just been dealing with injuries is my guess i don't think we know the details of what those injuries are necessarily but it seems like people have been been missing Um, i was able to tune into the second half of this game and that's what the broadcast team at christopher newport had said that trey barber left that game i think around halftime and then did not return was not able to return so i don't know what what um his situation is there hopefully they're able to get these guys back though at some point maybe after at least after the new year whatever go get rolling Um, Christopher Newport not having that conference schedule, they kind of have to front load things a little bit because into January and February, I think teams play a lot more conference games. So they're, they're maybe playing more than normal, um, this, this time of year, maybe not. That's my impression of them though. Uh, and so it might be difficult to get these guys in and healthy when they're running with these injury situations. I I'm going to guess once they get everyone back, they're going to be, they're going to be fine. But, um, another defeat here for Christopher Newport by six against Virginia Wesleyan. I think Virginia Wesleyan's really good. Uh, I don't think this is a really a shameful loss by any stretch by Chris, Christopher Newport. Uh, but it's just another, another one that's mounted. They're not quite the team, um, that they, that we saw last year. They're still trying to figure some things out. They're still trying to put the pieces together. Um, but I mentioned on the Virginia Wesleyan side of things, I think they're looking really good. Uh, their rate, their defensive rating is, we're going to look at this later, but they're like one of the top, if not the top defensive teams in the country. So they're really holding teams um, uh, down uh, from scoring points. I know actually Christopher Newport was able to score some points in this game. Uh, but yeah, it's just um, a, a great matchup and, and and great on the Marlins for being able to win this one. Being a coast to coast conference member, Christopher Newport schedule is always a little bit interesting. You know, they, you- yeah. They probably do have to front load it a little bit just because they don't have the traditional conference schedule to play. So they have to fill their their schedule in when teams are available. Right. And so that often means out of this first part of the season. Um, But the good news, then, if they are dealing with a swath of injuries, is that uh, 
through that more traditional conference portion of of the the calendar you know they don't play quite as many games as a team playing a traditional conference schedule so maybe that's a time when they can kind of get healthy get right and uh kind of get back to being um this group that we uh we saw at the end of last season and kind of expected to see continue um into this season and it's been it's been a surprising number of losses, I, th- I think, for Christopher Newport. But we should also look at the schedule. They're playing all these other really good teams, oh, yeah. right? So it's it's oh, not yeah. like they're losing to nobody's. It's they're competitive no. games typically. Um, typically, you know, they did have a big loss at Hampton Sydney opening night, but they're they're playing a really good schedule and they're winning some of the games or losing some of the games. So um, I, th- I think they're going to be fine. I agree. Yep. All right, Saturday, Matt, was a real showcase for ranked teams, a uh, number of ranked teams in action, getting big wins. Matt, we talked about Calvin getting a big road win at St. Norbert. It was a 88-66 game. Uh, Jalen Overway had 26 points in just 23 minutes of play. He had a little bit of foul trouble that limited it, and then you know down the stretch, the, the game was not in doubt. Um, so 23 minutes is less than he's used to playing, but still put up 26 points. Um, that was just about, uh, you know, you know, matched uh, by Evan Glazer on the St. Norbert side. He was outstanding, 26 points in 24 minutes for them. But really the difference in the game was just kind of what else yeah. each team had. And and for that, uh, Kelvin had a balanced attack. They had five guys in double figures. They had eight players um, make at least one three-pointer, Matt. So just a lot more options overall offensively uh, for Kelvin in the win. Yeah, and defensively, Calvin was able to shut down everyone not named Evan Glazer uh, for the most part, and and St. Norbert had difficulty making field goals. And as you said, that balanced scoring attack for Calvin, I, th- I think five five players in double figures, uh, all of the starters in double figures, they shot 42 or 43% from beyond the arc. I think they shot like 72% on their two-point attempts, I calculated, um, 75% on their free throws um, or so. So it was just when, when Calvin plays that type of offense you know we think of them as a defensive team when they shoot that well they're going to be almost impossible to beat when you when overweight is at 26 points they shut you down defensively and they're making their three pointers um you mentioned this being a potential trap game i felt similarly this was the first true road game of the season for calvin they played home games they played neutral court games but they had not played a road game this was it and um they, they came out really well and just kind of put their mark on the game and took care of business and got out of there with a much needed win. Uh, staying out there in Wisconsin for one more game on Monday night before heading home for a little bit of a, a little bit of a holiday break. Yeah, and number one, John Carroll, Matt. Of course, we we saw the the last top twenty five poll come, come out. John Carroll, number one. Kelvin, number two, by just one poll point. Yeah. Um, and you know, Kelvin gets an impressive win. John Carroll gets an impressive win. Uh, blowing out Wilmington. Of course, we talked. We talked in the past about Wilmington jumped up and they they bit Mount Union, right? But uh, no such repeat here with another one of the OAC favorites. Yeah, this was John Carroll getting out to a big lead very quickly, forty three nineteen scoring margin at halftime. I think it ended up ninety two to fifty four. This game was never in doubt. John Carroll just took care of business. Um, as you you mentioned, Wilmington has beaten Mount Union. They've beaten good teams. Um, but then they lost to Marietta this last week and then John Carroll. So, um, you know, obviously the good teams in the OIC are able to beat Wilmington and no number one curse for John Carroll. I think we've seen two weeks in a row. They've been in the top spot and now have just been able to take care of business. So they're, they're, they're a very, very strong team. Um, you know, region seven battle number one and number two in the country right now, both putting up impressive, impressive wins. Uh, and then just, uh, you mentioned the ranked teams getting big wins, big numbers on, on Saturday. So just to run down some other scores, NYU beat Delaware Valley. I think that was a 42 point margin. Mount Union beat Capital by 11 points. Capital's a pretty strong team in the OAC. Uh, Wash U, who's number 17, uh, beat Fontbonne by 21. And Trinity, Texas, uh, they're number 22. They beat U Dallas by 35 points. So I think every ranked team that played on Saturday won by double digit margins. So just taking care of business doing what was expected, coming out of exams. Like you said, maybe they're just all like, whew, that's over. Let's get down to business, play some basketball. A lot of good teams, and they're doing what good teams do. All right, Matt, so we talked about the top 25 there. We do have a bit of a break here uh, until the next top 25. It's going to be into the new year is when we expect the next top 25. Uh, And just with, you know, in the past when there's not been a ballot, we've you've given us a mock ballot to look at. Um, 
not going to do that this week. It just it wasn't as big of a week. I don't think there probably would have been much movement from what you had uh, previously. But Matt, it is time to reset a, a new or a different type of rankings, and those are the rankings based on the efficiency computer ratings. <clears throat> Yeah, so we talked about the efficiency ratings in the preseason, right? I released the preseason ratings. We did a whole episode on on the computer projections and what those mean. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we looked at some movers up and down for um, who's been kind of off to a good start, better beating the computers. So I think this is a good time to look at these computer ratings again because we're at about the eight game mark. And as we talked about early in the season, the eight game mark for each team is when the preseason projection completely falls out and we're just looking at what they've done in this season. So completely in-season data, any preconceived notion the computer has had um, get, gets pushed out of there. So, so we're going to talk about those efficiency ratings today. We're going to look through some of the numbers, some of the top 10 offenses, top 10 defenses, the fastest teams, the slowest teams. Uh, but just going to start here with this little slide, just reminding everyone what the computer ratings or what the efficiency ratings are and what that means. Uh, just three kind of quick bullet points I wanted to hit here. First is the ratings are tempo free. So if a team plays fast or plays slow, that doesn't necessarily give you a high offensive number or a low defensive number. So a fast team might score 100 points every game, um, but they might do that in about 100 possessions. So that might not be a good offense. That might just be a fast offense. So uh, we, we try to take the tempo out when we look at the efficiency ratings. We're just looking at a per possession basis, or, or usually the numbers are then changed to per 100 possessions just to get a nice 100 baseline there. Um, and then the teams are sorted or organized by efficiency margin. And this is their differential between points scored and points allowed, you know, per 100 possessions. So uh, on average, the, the more you score and the less you let the other team score, the better team you are, right? That's the novel concept of the efficiency ratings is, is you want points and you don't want the other team to get points. Uh, and then the way I do this is I try to adjust for opponent quality. So you take... Take an iterative approach and you say, what team did did you play and how many points did they typically give up? And, and then how many of the points did the teams that they play typically give up? And you try to iterate that through until it stabilizes to say, if you're putting up a big margin against a bad team, you know, that might be a good result. That might be only a so-so result. If you're putting up a good margin against a top team, a top 50 team, um, a top 25 team, then that's a, gr that's a great margin. So we try to look at opponent quality and adjust based on that. That's why you see if you go to d3datacast.com and look at the efficiency ratings, um, I'll put that like ADJ offense, the adjusted offense. That means it's adjusted for opponent quality. We're not just looking at the raw totals for a game. We're running that through an iterative process to, to check out who those margins were against and, and what that kind of means at a deeper level than just, just raw points. So uh, just diving in first, we're going to take a look here on the screen. If you're on the Spotify uh, version, you won't be able to see this, but maybe check out the YouTube episode. But here is just the current as of Sunday night, December 17. What is the top 40 of the computer ratings? Uh, and this looks, you know, pretty different than the preseason, especially at the top. Um, I think we had teams like Randolph Macon and Christopher Newport up near the top. Right now we have Trinity, Connecticut as the number one team in the country with a plus 35 efficiency margin. Uh, you can see there on the screen as well, they're doing it with a very strong offense and a very strong defense. They're top 10 in both of those categories, and that leads to a plus 35 uh, efficiency margin. And what that plus 35 means is if Trinity, Connecticut played an average Division Three team, you know, there's 400 and let's say 20 Division Three teams, if they played team number 200 or 210, um, every 100 possessions, they would be expected to outscore them by 35 points. So that's that plus 35. If you see teams below average, they'll, their ratings will be minus because they they would be expected to lose to a, uh, an average team by a few points per 100 possessions. Um, so yeah, the, these teams at the top of the ratings are the teams that we've been talking about mostly at the top of the, the D3 Hoops top, top 25 poll. You see Hampton City there at number two, Emory at four, uh, Calvin at five. Um, the top 10 is rounded out by Widener, uh, Guilford at eight, John Carroll at nine, Keene State at 10. Uh, maybe one of the surprises though is Randolph Macon who the computer, my efficiency rating still likes at number three, and they've been struggling to get votes because they've have, they already have three losses on the year. There's more losses than it, um, we're used to seeing, but they've played an incredibly strong schedule. So the, com the computer, again, only looking at this year's data, no preseason projection in there anymore for Randolph-Macon says, 
Uh, yeah, but they've played good teams and they've scored points against those teams and they've prevented those teams from scoring points. They haven't won all those games, but they've performed. You know, if they're playing Hampton Sydney. Um, you you can lose that game and still come up with a a positive rating, right? If you play Christopher Newport and you win that game, um, did they win beat Christopher Newport or they lose to Christopher Newport. Now I'm forgetting on on the result of that game. But again, you're playing teams like they won. Virginia. Yeah, they won. Okay, and, and then they they, they, they beat they, Newport and they split with Virginia Wesleyan, right? So you're you're winning right. a game like that, you're losing a game like that. Those can all be positive ratings. Uh, so the computer has looked at the totality of Randolph Macon's resume and says, hey, they I think they're still like a top five team based on who they've played and what those margins are. So um, we again, just because we're in-season data doesn't mean we're 100% correct. We're going to continue to get more information. We've still only played, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 games for most of these teams. So these these will, will continue to be fluid to some degree. Um, but it kind of subverts our expectations a little bit to see a team like Randolph-Macon uh, kind, of, kind of that high. Um, so I, I, I think a good system like this, I think there's an old Bill James baseball adage that like a good metric should kind of confirm 80% of what you know and then kind of surprise you 20% of the time. And I think Randolph making that three is maybe one of those 20, 20% that surprises you. Uh, so we'll have to see what they do in ODAC play. Like there's a lot of ODAC teams just in the top 14 there's four ODAC teams. There's Hampton Sydney at two. There's Randolph Macon at three. There's Guilford at eight. And there is uh, Virginia Wesleyan at 14. So that's um, that's a tremendous league. There's going to be a lot of wins and a lot of losses. And teams that aren't even on this list are still good enough to maybe beat some of these teams at some time. So it's going to be tremendous to watch how those teams shift as the season goes on. Yeah, so newsflash, the ODAC is a good league that has some really good teams at the top. Yeah. Yeah, if you didn't know that, right. then the computer will just confirm that for you. Yeah. Well, Matt, and you talk about, you know, this is while we're kind of at that point where we're, we're transitioned to all in-season data, but we're going to get more, you know, that picture will get filled in. And also, I think as, as that happens, we get more and more games. You get more of a stabilizing effect, right? So if you're at eight games, each game has 12.5% um of the uh, uh, impact on that that total, right? By the time we get to 20 games, each game is only 5% of the total. So you have uh, maybe a really good game or a really bad game. You're not going to see as many swings yeah. and and that number really gets dialed in or stabilized more uh, with a, a bigger set of games. Correct, yes, yes. It starts, as, assuming the, the, the results are consistent with each other to a large degree, it'll, it'll stabilize in on those numbers. Yeah, for sure. Right. And Matt, just to go back to, you talked about that 20% of, you know, maybe subverting expectations, you know, the, some of those teams we talked about last week, you still see showing up here, St. John's, you know, number 18, you know, that, yeah. that list we talked about in the previous episode of teams that the computer really liked in the top 40 that had not yet received any top 25 uh, votes, um, you know, just a couple more spots down there. Number 20, Heidelberg, we talked about them last week. We talked about Wesleyan. Uh, 25. We talked about Hanover, Hanover. 27, right? So, so um, Clark, 37. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, exactly, right. So, continue those that group of teams continues to um, show up here, and it'll be interesting to keep tracking them, see if you know maybe uh, they they do get on the top 25 radar. All right, dialing in in a little bit, just wanted to look at some of the teams, kind of top 10-ish in some of these categories. Uh, so here, this slide is the top 10 offenses. We're looking at that adjusted offensive rating. Um, and again, these are points per 100 possessions. So these are the the, the best numbers you'll, you'll see out there. Um, and I always like to also look just at how a team is shaped. So if a team is really good on offense, how are they on defense? Are they are they kind of equally good? You know, we talked about Trinity, Connecticut, kind of being equally good on both sides. Uh, right here at the top, though, um, the number one offense is the computer's number 39 overall team, which is Case Western Reserve, a team that's in the top 25, kind of getting a lot of attention. I think they're a really good team. I'm voting them in the top 25, so I'm I'm, I'm seeing them higher than the computer. Uh, but they have a they have a stellar offense here, 122.6, uh, number one offense. But their defense, we'll talk about defense a little bit later. But their defense is 104, which means they're they're allowing um, 
more points than average on the defensive end. So they're scoring a ton of points, but it's easy to score on them. I don't know if that's because of, of the, this, the system that they're running, if they're, if they're giving up points to get points, uh, kind of like maybe a Greenville might do or something like that. I, I suspect that's not, but that might be a cause of for concern for Case Western Reserve as we go into UAA play. Yeah, when they play other top offenses like an NYU or like an Emory or like a Wash U, teams that can, can score the points, um, are they going to be able to defend the other team enough um, or is the other team going to be able to shut them down? Um, that, that, that's kind of interesting to look at matchups like that and see how they kind of go. Uh, but yeah, the top 10 offenses, Case, NYU is number two. Loris from the American Rivers is the third best offense. Emory, another UAA team, is fourth. Ramapo, a team we've talked about as, as kind of a team on the rise out of the NJAC. Uh, Hampton, Sydney's the sixth best offense. St. John's, number seven. Trinity, Connecticut, eight. DeSales, nine. And St. Norbert, the 10 best off, 10th best offense in the country. Yeah, so the list starts and ends, Matt, with similarly shaped teams where you have really top, top-notched top um, offensive efficiency ratings, but lacking on the defensive end, and that's dragging down their overall um, adjusted efficiency margin once you once you put those two together and you talk about possible cause for concern with case western reserve um you know you see it seems like the some of the uaa teams show up on this list as opposed to the next list we're talking about but you talk about uh, you know maybe not a top 10 but wash U traditionally mm-hmm. has been um a very good defense so what you know what happens when they get into UAA play in case Western Reserve has to go up against like a Wash U. Can they maintain that efficiency offensively that's, uh, you know, really been the hallmark of their success so far? Yeah. Um, and but that and I should say, you know, that doesn't mean a team that's shaped that way doesn't mean that they're automatically going to crumble when they play other good teams. Uh, two years ago, we saw Wabash make a Final Four. Uh, and they were very similar to what this Case Western Reserve looks like from what the computer thought they looked like. They were a very good offense. They were in the number one or the number two offense that season, but their defense was kind of equally um, average or a little bit suspect maybe. And they, they made it to the final four. They made a good tournament run. So that's it's definitely possible to have a team like that carry you all the way through. Uh, it's just that you're not as balanced as maybe the computer is seeing some of these other teams. Yeah, ultimately it's totally about that that overall adjusted efficiency margin. There's lots of different ways to get to a higher number, but of course it's easier to be um, to get that higher number. If you're contributing on both sides of the equation here, actually, you know, with case Western reserve uh, that defensive number is subtracting um, from what they're doing offensively. So that the overall efficiency margin is a bit lower. Yeah. All right. Moving over to defenses. Here's the top 10 defenses. Zach, we talked about Virginia Wesleyan. Um, Look at their number here. They're number one overall on defense, uh, 79.8 defense, uh, defensive rating. That means um, they're the only team in the 70s there for, for defense. So if you gave the other team 100 possessions, they would score less than 80 points on those against Virginia Wesleyan's defense. Uh, that's very strong. Those are among the strongest numbers we've seen. I think maybe like at times last year, St. Joseph, Connecticut was putting up really good numbers. I think they were a strong defense um, last year. So th- that's that that's... It's impressive to say the least. Um, Mary Washington, the second best defense. Tufts, a team that's gotten a lot of helium, a lot of rise the last few weeks um, as the number three defense. Trinity, Connecticut, again, top 10 in both categories. That's why the computer says them says they're number one. We'll have to see if they can continue that from non-conference play into NESCAC play. But so far, they're looking strong on both ends of the floor. Uh, then another Trinity, Trinity, Texas, the number five defense. Redlands. Uh, that high pressure defense causes a lot of turnovers. Um, that's that's one way to be very excellent on defense. Uh, Calvin is the seventh best defense. Randolph Macon is the eighth best defense. Illinois College Blue Boys number one in field goal percent defense. I think in all of the country. Uh, and then Widener Widener is the tenth best defense. So here's the look at the top ten defenses. Um, I think here we're seeing teams that we're very used to uh, being in and around the top twenty five conversation this year. Uh, for the most part. Man, I'm glad you went through the the actual brief explanation at the beginning. We talk about the the importance of being tempo free here. And it really jumps out to me as we're looking at the defenses here where you see Redlands who plays at the third fastest tempo. And uh, you got Randolph Macon who plays at one of the absolute slowest paces in division three ranked 414th overall, right? But on a per 100 possessions basis, they're very similar um, in terms of that defensive 
efficiency. Once once you account for the vast differences in pace, um, they come out very similar. Yeah, and and on average, I should say, um, on average, a, a Division three men's basketball team will score about one point per possession or 100 points per 100 possessions. So you see the difference there. The far right column that actually did crop into this is the adjusted tempo. The adjusted T is the adjusted tempo. That's how many possessions per game you play on average. So you compare Red- Redlands, like you just said, to Randolph-Macon. That's about, that's like 21 possessions average on average difference there. So that's about the scoring total. Like Redlands will will give up 21 more points than Randolph-Macon will in a game, but that's just based on the number of opportunities the other team has. So like Redlands will get another opportunity of their own on offense for every when they give up on defense. So if you just look at the the scoring numbers, Randolph-Macon's games are going to be in like the 50s and 60s or 40s. We've seen games in the 40s for Randolph-Macon. Redlands is going to have a lot of games in the 80s and 90s and probably touching 100. Like if, if a Redlands game is in the 70s, like you, you kind of are like, wow, that wasn't a very high scoring game for Redlands. Um, but the difference there is is mostly just in the tempo. Like you called out, Randolph Macon is is slow. They're going to take their time on offense. They're going to force you into a tough shot on defense. Um, Redlands defense, their defensive ability is primarily based on their ability to turn you over and turn you over quickly. So you might inbound the ball, not be able to give it over to half court. You're going to pass the ball twice and get it stolen. And they're going to go and try to get a layup. And and that's a very fast pace, but it's still a very good defense because you're not able to get down the court to get your own shot very often. So a very, I'm, I'm glad that they're so close in this, like you said. Um, it's very different styles, but similar effectiveness overall. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you know, we're watching Kelvin all the time. Very uh, half-court oriented defense, right? They're going to... Uh, yeah. Basically, when they're at their best, they're forcing you into a difficult, long two-point shot, right? Which you're likely to shoot a low percentage on and then getting that rebound, not giving up the second opportunity. Um, So, yeah, lots of ways to get it done. You can do it fast. You can do it slow. You know, you can can try to turn them over in the backcourt like Redlands is doing. You can limit them in the frontcourt. It just, you know, lots of ways to do it. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of tempo, Matt, yeah. I thought this would be, you know, it doesn't, like we like we said, it, there isn't anything inherently um, better about being faster or being uh, slower, right? But it's kind of interesting just to see styles and, and how, how things work out. So we wanted to, while it doesn't factor necessarily into um, a team's rating here, just thought it would be interesting to take yeah. a the look at who are the teams that play the fastest, who are the teams that play the yeah. slowest. Yeah, this is interesting too. Uh, well, it, it's the teams you expect right at the top, right? Greenville and Grinnell, who are both known for playing that kind of system style uh, game, high pressure, try to get a layup, almost, okay, I mean, they're going to quibble at, I'm just saying this in generalities, right? Almost okay, giving a layup on the other end to get a quick three, a quick shot, uh, just get more and more opportunities, right? That's not the Redlands style. And you can see even there's a tempo difference between like Greenville to Grinnell and Redlands. Um, but Redlands is still high tempo. If you can break Redlands press, you can still get a layup on them. They're not trying to get get a layup, um, trying to give up a layup. They will give some up. Uh, but their 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 defense is a lot stronger. You can see just the ratings. Like Greenville and Grinnell don't put up good grief defensive numbers right now. Um, they give up a ton of points and and they're bad defense. Redlands will sometimes put up high scoring totals, or against them teams will put up high scoring totals. But that's because of the tempo. Um, but they they're doing it with a very good defense. The the Eric Bridgeland system is getting them to play a very fast paced pressure disciplined system where they have to work together uh, and, and they're getting a lot of success. Um, but the other th- fast teams are more in the tempo range of Redlands. So university of new England and McMurray kind of in those eighties, not in the nineties and 100 possessions. Uh, so yeah, really Greenville and Grinnell are on kind of an Island of their own in that really fast paced, give up, score a lot and give up a lot of points kind of style. And then looking at the slowest teams, um, down here in kind of like the 60, 63, 64 possession range, uh, Connecticut College, Penn State Barron, actually, from the AMCC, uh, Randolph, Macon, Guilford, and NESCAC from the Amherst. When I think of slow teams, I think of like WIAC teams and NESCAC teams and ODAC teams, uh, just teams that are going to 
their their offensive possessions are going to grind you out. They're going to use every second of the shot clock, and then they're going to find like a, a a backdoor cut at the end, or they're going to get a guy finally open for a three, um, and just just wear you out. That's kind of what I, what I think. And then on defense, right? They're going to both both sides of the coin are going to going to wear you down. They're just going to grind you and force you into tough shots on defense. So um, that's that's a big possession range you can see there from the lowest to the highest teams that's 30 possessions if you think that's just on average 30 points difference just based on pace right pace alone mm -hmm. it also helps to explain some of the games we've seen this year between say randolph macon and virginia wesleyan okay yeah. so virginia wesleyan they didn't make the the top 10 defense uh slide there we had but they're not far off of it right and they also are not on the slowest team slide here, but they're also not far off of it. Of course, we have talked about Randolph Macon, um, a top 10 defense and one of the slowest teams. So really it's a, it's a combination in a game between Virginia Wesley and Randolph Macon. You've got two of the best defenses in terms of, um, you know, efficiency and, and two teams that play at very slow paces. So this is how you get games where both teams yeah. end up in the 40. 44 40s. to 49 or whatever that first game was. That, I, I have to go back right. and check, but that game probably only had, you know, like low 50s of possessions or something. So if you have a little bit of an off shooting right. rate, your scoring total is going to be going to be really low. And if I remember correctly, I don't think Virginia Wesleyan broke. 40 and or broke 50 in either game against Randolph-Macon. I'd have, to, I'd, I'd have to double check, but yeah. it's just like both of those games felt like a race to 50. If yeah. someone could get there, they would they would definitely win. Yeah. And, you know, it's not like it's bad offense. It's good defense. It's slow, deliberate pace of play. And there's just not as many opportunities. Yep. Yep, for sure. All right, Matt. So this was a bit of an update kind of to the episode we did uh, bringing out the preseason projections. And at that time, we decided to make a little, uh, I don't know if we'd say it's necessarily a contest, but we made our preseason picks to beat projections. We were looking for a team inside uh, the top 25, inside the top 100, and then for a team outside the top 100 that we thought would outperform their preseason projection. And then also we picked one team to miss their preseason projection so we have on the screen here a reminder of who we were looking at um in each of those slots and so now that we're basically in full season mode not not quite every team has played that eight games where their in, their information is solely based on this season but the vast majority of teams have played at least eight games and so that transition has been made uh matt so let's take a look at where things stand based on our preseason picks so yeah, I don't know that we are very great at this game, Zach. Um, just looking at the the ranking, just looking at the ranking here. Um, yeah, you want to just look at the ranking. I've got a bone to pick, but continue. Okay, sure. Uh, Wash U came in at what seventeen or something like that, and all right, we can go back. They were number fourteen. You picked them to beat. Uh, I had Case Western at twenty. Uh, they're checking in currently right now at 29 and 39. So they are both below their ordinal ranking that they were projected at. Um, we were both correct on our kind of our top 100 or not. We were not correct. It's not over yet, right? Where we are at this at this this point in the season, this eight game mark. John Carroll looks looks great. They are number nine. The 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 for a variety of reasons, right? They came into the season number ninety eight. Uh, I had NYU at thirty four. NYU was to me going to be maybe one of the top five teams in the country. They have beaten thirty four, but they're only at twenty six. Um, and then I shot the biggest layup in the history of this of this contest, picking North Park from one hundred one. Um, you had Carthage similar layup at one seventeen, and uh, Carthage is in that range one twenty five, and North Park. Uh, has fallen 142, Zach. So uh, both of us have two out of four missing their ordinal rank on that side of things. And uh, for our for our for our teams that we thought were too high that were going to be lower, we're both getting those directionally correct. Correct. You had Yeshiva, who is um, I think 66, uh, and they are now 140. I had Wheaton, who is still in the top 25, and they are now 233. So go ahead and quibble with me, Zach. So while you are correct that. I'm off the pace here with Wash U and Carthage in terms of their ranking. In terms of their actual efficiency margin, I, I'm i three for three. 
Okay. So you go back. Wash U is better than a plus 17.6 at the moment. And Carthage is better than a plus 6.3 at the moment. So I don't care about the rank. I, I was looking to beat the preseason projected efficiency margin, and I'm doing it. I'm three for three. Okay, good job. <clears throat> All right, so that's where things stand on our little game so far. We're doing nothing. All right, on to, our next, on to our next little game, Matt. We have picks to review from week six. Our slate started with uh, York, Pennsylvania playing at Rochester. The computer was giving them eight points, and uh, York did manage to cover despite a 73-66 loss. Uh, Matt, now finally, in the in in it took us uh, into our second year before we finally pushed a game in in this contest. Montclair State played at Ramapo. The computer liked Ramapo as twelve point favorites, and Matt Ramapo left as twelve point winners. So we were both on Montclair State. That one pushes. And I think also the final score for each team was just one point high. I think the computer had seventy one eighty three, and uh, it was seventy two eighty four. So it, the computer was dead okay. on on this so one. There- so there's some room for improvement. Got it. <laughs> All right. U Dallas was getting five and a half at Shriner. Uh, Shriner covered the five and a half with, as an 83-76 winner. Capital was getting eight and a half at Mount Union. Mount Union covers that at home, 79-68. And in the D3 Datacast game of the week, some teams we've talked about a few times here, Matt. Virginia Wesleyan uh, was getting half a point at Christopher Newport. And they get the outright win, 74-68. Tally it all up, Matt. I went two, two, and one. I am now eighteen, eleven, and one on the season. You went three, one, and one, and uh, are sixteen, thirteen, and one. Congratulations, you won the week. I'm reeling you in. We're gonna we're gonna go on a run here. All right. So taking a look at this week's picks, here are the games. I will read them off, and then we will make the picks. Uh, game one is Roanoke. They are three and a half point favorites uh, by the computers versus Eastern. The next game is Trine. They are three and a half point underdogs at Elmhurst. I think this is our only, uh, one of only two maybe true road games. I'm actually not sure about that John Carroll game at the end. Is that a true road game? That's at um, John Carroll, yes. That's at John, okay. The third game is Mount Union. They are getting two points versus St. John's. Then we have Whitworth, uh, who is nine point underdogs versus Dubuque. I believe this is out in Hawaii, Zach if uh, I remember what I you told so. me. Yep. And then the D3 Datacast game of the week is a biggie. It is Hampton, Sydney, minus 0.5, nearly a pick at John Carroll. So let's jump up to the top, Zach. Roanoke and Eastern, three and a half point computer line. What do you like? So, Matt, as I've observed Roanoke over the last uh, you know year into this year here, I, I feel like they're the... They're the kind of team that gets wins that puts them like on the doorstep of top 25, top 25 consideration, but they just haven't been able to get over the hump against those like top, like the absolute like top tier in the ODAC. And uh, I think we've seen that like continuing this year, uh, this game here against Eastern, I see more as like the type of game that they win that puts them in pers- in position to be kind of in that conversation. So I will go with the Maroons, even laying the three and a half. Yeah. Um, I think I, I really want to trust in the strength of the ODAC here. Roanoke has been a team that's been a little bit hard to pin down for me this time of year. I was looking at that three and a half point uh, computer line and thinking it was a little bit big, but I think at the end of the day, um, I just have a little bit of more um, faith in what an ODAC team can do. Maybe that's my bet. Maybe I'm going to be proven wrong here, but I'm going to go with the Maroons as well. Uh, game number two, Trine and Elmhurst. What is your selection, Zach? I'm going to go with Elmhurst here, Matt. We've talked in the past that Elmhurst has been one of those teams that we just haven't been able to find out a whole lot about until a little bit more recently. Um, they got picked up a couple of really good conference wins um, in that early portion of the CCIW. This is kind of their first opportunity to really get a good non-conference win. And um, I think I think that uh, I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing from Elmhurst as they stepped into CCIW play. Uh, I, I think... I think they're ready for a big win in my conference as well. All right, Zach, I am going to, um, I'm going to go stick with our own conference here in the MIAA. I'm going to go with Trine. This is going to be a big game for them. It's a road game, 
three and a half point line is nothing to sneeze at, but I, I believe in the Thunder this year. I think that they're a good team. I think they they um, could use statement wins like this as we move into January, then February regional ranking time. Uh, so I, th- I think this is one trying to come out strong, and I think that they might be uh, one of the best teams that Elmhurst has played so far this year. So I'm going to go for the Thunder winning, uh, well, maybe not winning, but covering on the road and, and making a run at winning this game for sure. All right, Mount Union plus two versus St. John's. Yeah, Mount Union's had some uneven results so far this season. I haven't been quite sure what to make of them. Obviously, you know, the the potential's there, the talent's there. We saw that, you know, last year in their tournament run. Um, I tried picking against them last week, and that didn't go well for me. I will go with Mount Union here plus the two, but I feel like the way that uh, Mount Union's season has gone, I'm just um, guaranteeing a St. Yeah. John's win. Yeah, this was one. I, 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 this is a game I would usually pick St. John's. Um just based on you know not being confident with with what Mount Union has done, I think St. John's is looking pretty strong by the computers. Um, I, I'm going to get the impression that Mount Union's going to get a little bit mad right now. I think they were dropping in the polls. I think they've had you know a result or two in the past that they didn't quite like. We saw them with a good win over Capital this last week, and I think they're going to I think they're going to find it. Uh, Christian Parker had a great game against Capital. Um, I think Mount Union still has really great players. I think they're still a really great team. I think they, I think they cover the game. I think they win straight up against St. John's. All right, now Zach, our biggest spread of the week is Whitworth and Dubuque. Who do you like here? Yeah, you mentioned this being the biggest spread. I, I do like Dubuque as an outright winner, but it's just a case where the nine is too much for me to lay. So I, I'm going to go with Whitworth here, uh, taking the points. Yeah, when I saw this this line at nine, and that's why I mentioned it, it would just at the end of the day was I, I just couldn't pick against a nine point spread against two programs that I think are still pretty good. Uh, Dubuque, I would pick straight up all day, right? But that's not the question here. Um, the question is, is Dubuque going to win by eight, and then Whitworth still covers this? This there's a lot. It seems, feels like there's a lot of room here where Dubuque still wins just fine, and and Whitworth covers. Um, so that that's why I went with the Pirates. Uh, again, I think I think this is one Dubuque wins, but I think Whitworth can keep it in the single digits here. And then the game of the week, big game, Hampton Sydney at John Carroll. It's basically a pick'em. I feel like it wouldn't be the game of the week without an ODAC team, Matt. It seems like that's the way things have gone so far. Um, but I'm going to go with John Carroll. I think that the computer traditionally has been a little bit lower on John Carroll than the voting public. And so I think maybe the line reflects that a little bit too. I, I think what it comes down to is that John Carroll may have a bit of a tendency to play to the level of their competition. And so some of those margins in wins that should be maybe a little bit more comfortable by the final score aren't quite as impressive as um, the computer would like to see. But here we got Hampton Sydney coming to town. If we're talking about a team that plays the level of competition, this is going to be a game John Carroll's up for. I will take them at home in, like you said, a virtual pick them. Yeah, this one is interesting for me because I'm voting these teams right next to each other. I think I had Hampton Sydney 5, John Carroll 6, or 4 and 5, or, or some order they're right next to each other. It's at John Carroll. I feel like that should mean I probably just wanted to pick the home court, but for whatever reason, um, I just felt myself being pulled toward um, Hampton Sydney. Uh, and so I'm going to make that pick even though it's a road game, even though it's basically means they have to straight up win. Um, I think they've, I think of the two, I think they've the one that has been, I think more consistently tested already this season. They've played a lot of strong games. I don't think this type of contest will be unfamiliar to them right now. So um, I think just, I'm going to go with that experience to date, not because I think that they're necessarily a much better team. I think this is going to be a great game. I think these are two even teams. But I'm just going to go with the experience still early in December here, and I'm going to pick Hampton, Sydney. What do you think? Oh, um, I think I agree with you on three picks. Okay. So if we can get those, you can get those three right, and then you can get the other two wrong. All right. Should we go in the mailbag? Mailbag. Okay, Matt, we've got uh, another mailbag item here from Tyler Peretz. If the tournament were to start now, who would you each have as the top four teams in the tourney? Uh, Yeah, do you have a top four, Zach? 
I do. So I think I think if you were to let me have four teams and you had the field, I think the four teams that I would pick right now, Matt, are Guilford, Puffs, Oswego State, and Calvin. You know, that's kind of a mix of teams that have gotten off to really good starts. Um, you know, especially Tufts, we talked about just kind of the one by one. They, they've, they put together a pretty good resume and starting off undefeated. Guilford has some good wins. Um, Calvin now has some good wins. And I think just, you know, great defense, some, some balance. I think they're figuring things out to be a little bit more consistent offensively. And, you know, not many teams have a Jalen Overway. One team mm-hmm. has a Jalen Overway. And Oswego State, while we haven't quite seen that yet, um, I think just, just based on um, what we thought that team could be, what we you know saw them getting a, a really good win in the tournament last year, it's like they're one of those teams that they haven't had the the type of schedule yet that they've really been able to prove a lot, but they haven't done anything wrong. So I think I still think they're a very dangerous team. You know, if we were starting the tournament today, so those are my four. Yeah, the four teams that you just. Um rattled off are the four teams that I'm voting for one through four in my poll. So the, I think those, those are my opinion, the best teams that we've seen so far this year. Uh, so yeah, I think that I think those are great picks. Um, I think the other way I would take this question um, is kind of my computer systems. If I pair them together can kind of spit out projected top four seeds. And I've been kind of doing that. I've been tweeting them out from my um, at FFT MAG uh, Twitter handle. A- and if you look at what that kind of end of the regular season what that spits out is is Tufts, um, Hampton, Sydney, Emory, and Widener actually as as four teams that could be putting together um, top four resumes. Now I think one two teams that I mentioned Hampton, Sydney, and Emory. I think if if I'm considering them, that I have to consider Guilford because Guilford beat those two teams already. So um, I, I would if I was going to revise this, take it away from just a, a a dumb computer spitting out teams and revising it with my my human knowledge. I would maybe throw Guilford in there and, and take someone else out. But uh, these teams are all putting together really good resumes. So for instance, Tufts has already beaten Keene State, Clark, St. Joseph, Connecticut, WPI, and even Endicott, all teams that could probably end up in the regional rankings in their respective regions. So that's maybe, whatever I just said, five regionally ranked wins for Tufts. I think they're in the best position to get a top four overall seed, uh, kind of have a region built around them. Uh, Hampton Sydney has wins over Widener and Swarthmore. Um, we mentioned Swarthmore maybe getting a, a timeout of the top 25, but I think especially in Region 5, there's a lot of opportunities to get ranked in Region 5. They could be a ranked team. Um, Widener was a team I mentioned as maybe one of those top four uh, seeds, and Hampton Sydney has beaten them already, so that looks good. Um, oh, they, they've also beaten, sorry, down to a next line on my notes here. They've beaten Randolph Macon and Christopher Newport, I think two teams that could factor into to Region 6. Um, so that could be maybe four for Hampton City already in the bank. Um, and then Guilford, they've beaten Hampton Sydney and they've beaten Emory, two of those teams that are kind of in my mix. So I think f- those four or five teams, I think, are the best suited to um, get just put together these resumes that would consider them kind of these top teams. Um, again, though, other teams that we've talked about in this episode, um, I think Calvin's going to have an opportunity to play Trine twice in the regular season, they're going to probably be in the Region 7 rank- rankings. Um, John Carroll's playing in the OAC, right? They're going to play Mount Union more and Marietta more and get more of these regionally ranked wins so they could put together a resume as well. So uh, I think any of those, whatever we mentioned, like seven or eight teams, I think are the top teams right now. We're only in like still mid-December, mid-ish December. So there's going to be a lot of stuff to change. But I think those are the teams that are looking like um, could be battling best for kind of these top four ish seeds and, and hopefully have a a bracket built around them where they can host in the first weekend and maybe host in the second weekend, even if, if things break well for them. All right. Next up in the mailbag, Matt, we got two that we're going to combine into a, uh, a dual pack here. Uh, first from Greg Lewis holiday tournament time. For teams trying to get in last non-conference games, which holiday tournament has the best collection of teams? Who could increase their SOS the most by lifting a holiday trophy? And then similarly, from Drew LaTrenta, we have some big games and tournaments the week before Christmas, more than I remember before. Biggest important games to keep an eye on this week. Yeah, so this time of year, I think when we're talking about big events, big tournaments, we got to be talking about the D3Hoops.com Classic in Las Vegas, which kind of happens kind of in the window between Christmas and New Year's. 
for for my money, that's one of the two best events in the whole Division Three season. I guess excluding the actual NCAA tournament. Um, but in November we get the Great Lakes Invitational, and in December we get the D3Hoops.com Classic. Um, similar in that they like when good teams come out. Uh, D3 Hoops has the advantage of being like a men's and women's event, and they have them all playing at the same kind of event. Um, just way more games, way more teams even. So I think that's a great one. And they have a lot, they have a great field um, this week, Zach. You might have a little bit of a list for us. Yeah, I picked out kind of five uh, of the top men's games there to, that um, I think really highlight the event and and you'd put in that like big games category. Uh, starting with Clark against Trinity, Texas. Yeah. Oswego State uh, will play Case Western yeah. Reserve. Uh, Trinity, Texas' is also, other game there will be against Pomona Pitzer. Uh, Case Western Reserve's other game will be against Clark. And Oswego State and Pomona Pitzer also get matched up. So you you have uh, kind of a little two-game set here featuring uh, teams in um, – you know, including a list of Clark, Trinity, Texas, Oswego State, uh, Case Western Reserve, um, and Pomona Pitzer. Yeah, great to see those types of teams matched up for each other. Uh, those are the games they probably all want to play, like regionally ranked games. And those are the type of games we want to see as fans and that are going to give us a bunch of information on these teams and kind of like that cross-regional information. That's like what... That's that's exactly what you want to see in a D3Hoops.com classic. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm excited to be tuning into these matchups. Okay, so Drew was asking about this week, Matt. D3Hoops.com Classic, as you mentioned, we're actually this the know, following week. a week out. Yep. Uh, yeah, following week. Uh, so I have a few other games that are just this upcoming week that I wanted to highlight. Because one of the really cool things that we get, Matt, at this time of year are afternoon games. Right? So we get, we got this uh, this week coming up here. Maybe you need a, a little D3Hoops fix to get you through a work day and, and, and this week definitely delivers in that regard. So just there, I just kind of scanned the list quickly. So this is not necessarily comprehensive. I just wanted to pick out a game uh, for each day this week um, up through Thursday, Friday is when things uh, really kind of yeah. um, thin out. There are some games, but it's a lot of um, D3 teams playing non D3 games. Uh, and then, and then we have a few days where the the schedule really goes goes dark uh, over the Christmas uh, time. Uh, but Monday, starting right off Monday here, episode release day, Matt, we've got Trine at Anderson. That's going to be a 2 p.m. start. All these times I'm going to say are Eastern time. Uh, Tuesday, Matt, game we've talked about already, Hampton, Sydney at John Carroll. That'll be a 3 p.m. tip. Wednesday, we will see uh, Widener play Carthage. And I'm not sure exactly where that game is going to be played but that's an 11 a.m start uh and then thursday we've got washington and lee playing st thomas and i believe that game will be in uh, san antonio and that is a 3 p.m start so just some recommendations of course head to the schedule page on d3hoops.com uh they do a great job of updating it even manually if if need be uh, so uh, really encourage you to check that check, check that out this week because this is not just like, a, you know, you get to the evening portion and there's some yeah. games. There's games going to be kind of throughout the day. And uh, that's fun. Um, a fun little wrinkle that we see this time of year and not so much other times of the year. Yeah, take an hour and a half coffee break or so and watch one of these D3 Hoops games. I'm sure that's fine. So, uh, you know, do what you need to do. Yep. No judgment from us. Matt, that concludes another D3 Datacast. And that means it's time to give a big thank you to our patrons, Matt. We've got their names on the screen here. We couldn't do what we do without their help, without their support. Um, namely, you know, everything that's available on D3Datacast.com, all the efficiency uh, metrics that we've talked about, all the NCAA criteria dating, data and tracking that we do, all made possible by uh, these people. We're able to host that uh, information on on d3datacast.com without any ads on the website, without any paywalls for the information, uh, and just uh, just uh, super thankful that these people have uh, partnered with us in that endeavor. Yeah, we talked a lot about the data uh, in this episode. You can find the efficiency ratings, and then also the data like the NCAA uses, like their strength of schedule um, to, to make their decisions. 
You can find that on d3datacast.com. So if you enjoy those types of things, those types of models, uh, check it out, click it around there, uh, use that information. Let us know what you're looking at um, via Twitter at d3datacast. Uh, and if you're interested in joining us on Patreon and helping us support these efforts for the ad-free experience of d3datacast.com, uh, definitely check out that Patreon link below, patreon.com slash d3datacast, I believe is the link. Uh, and we thank you to all these people here on the screen who've helped us out, uh, helps us out a ton. Um, we couldn't do this show without you, as Zach said. So thank you very much, Zach. I had fun doing this episode with you this week. Good job, team.